Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, can you see that? Yes. So my name is Mauro Marchetti. I'm uh, actually part of Maori Microwave. And um, well, this is actually a subset of this presentation. Uh, what I will do is I will give a brief overview about load pool measurements. As, as Tony mentioned, load pool is a key tool in uh, basically validating your models, among other things. Uh, so I'll just discuss a bit the basics of the different technologies that we have today for doing load pool. Uh, the different setups, um, and, and maybe a little bit uh, do a comparison among them and discuss what's the best in terms of uh, using these measurements for model validation. Um, so that, that's a very short introduction, um, a very short outline, a small introduction to unique techniques, uh, and discuss the differences between scalar and vector receiver load pool. Uh, and then I'll hand uh, the floor back. Uh, uh, so, I don't know how many of you are familiar with load pool. I think if you are into modeling, you certainly come across uh, this type of measurements. Uh, into very simple terms, it's about changing your impedance to the device under test uh, and measuring parameters, uh, the, such as efficiency, power, and so on, um, hopefully in an automated uh, way. Um, in some cases, it's about determining the best matching or the best impedance for your application. In some other cases, like in this case, it's about basically changing or uh, making the device operate under nonlinear conditions and validating your model against, against uh, actual uh, large signal measurements. So there's uh, several techniques. I'll basically split into two types of, of comparison. So there's the, in, in load pool system, there's the tuning part. Um, and in this case, we're comparing there's passive systems versus active systems. So I'll talk a bit about this. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit about the measurement part. So in terms of tuning techniques, the most uh, probably known and simple way of changing the impedance or of doing load pool is using a passive mechanical tuner. So passive mechanical tuners are basically airlines, mechanical instruments. Um, there's a vertical probe that you can see there. I don't know if I have a... Do we have a pointer or? Oh, this one, thanks. So there's an airline. Uh, the pointer does not work. There you go. Yeah, so there's an airline here, uh, and there's a mechanical probe. You can move the probe up and down, and you can move the probe here. So basically, in simple terms, changing, moving the probe along the x direction will give you this type of movement on the Smith chart. Changing the probe in the y direction will give you this type of movement in the Smith chart. So basically, the probe creates a reflection. And you see that the gamma is a ratio of two waves, the wave B coming out of the device under test and the wave A that's reflected from the, the tuner or the tuning element. Um, so again, mechanical tuners are quite nice because they're simple to use. They're, uh, um, they're robust. They can handle very high powers. Uh, they have some limitations. Specifically, it's a passive instrument. So the A wave that's coming back onto your device under test uh, will always be lower than the B wave. So you cannot cover the whole Smith chart, which especially with very large devices, it's, it's important. Um, they can be rather slow because they have to move for every single impedance uh, mechanically with a motor. In recent years, there's, uh, let's say, Active tuning has gained a lot more popularity because it solves for some of the drawbacks of passive um, tuners. Uh, in an active load pool system, basically what you do is instead of creating the reflection physically um, with the probe, uh, you basically generate an, an A wave with a signal generator. So you have a, an independent source. Well, it's not really independent, but you have another source. You can change this source in amplitude and phase and basically, by changing the phase and the amplitude of this A wave, you can reach any gamma you want. Now, the, the nice thing about an active tuner is that you can plug in an amplifier in there. So your A wave can be as big as you want. Uh, and that means the, the, the losses of the passive network are not there anymore. You can create now any uh, reflection coefficient that you want uh, on the Smith chart. The other nice thing is that being this, uh, at least in modern implementation, an electronic system, it can be very fast. Now, in terms of, um, of the measurement, um, you have, let's say, several kind of systems. There's many different load pool uh, techniques. Uh, but we can uh, 
separate them into a scalar load pool system and vector receiver load pool system. Now, in a scalar load pool system, which is again probably the most simple form of load pool, um, the point is that you basically use power meters for doing power measurements. So the tuner changes your impedance. This is your device under test. The tuner can change your load impedance here, your source impedance here, and you have power meter to measure the, the power. Alternative, you can measure spectrum analyzers to measure the spectrum and the linearity and, and so on, um, such as in this schematic. So you have signal generators, you have amplifiers for generating your test signal. Uh, you might have couplers and the input to measure power or spectrum. Uh, you have a source tuner, you have device under test, you have a load tuner, and then again, you have a power meter to measure power, or you have a spectrum analyzer if you want to do linearity measurements. Very important thing about these type of systems is that since you're measuring power at this point, uh, you need to know exactly what your tuner is doing. So you need to have an accurate representation of your tuner in order to de-embed your measurements up to the device reference plane. So this whole structure is based on the pre-characterization of the tuner. So you need to measure your tuner offline with the vector network analyzer, and the accuracy of this measurement is highly reliant on the S parameter of the tuners. So again, to summarize, in uh, let's say a scalar load pool system, you measure scalar power by using power meters or spectrum analyzers. The measurements are de-embedded to a DUT by using the S parameter um, measure on the tuner offline. So it relies on a pre-characterization and it relies also on the repeatability of the tuner. So your tuner needs to be highly repeatable in order to have accurate measurements. Another important aspect, especially related to modeling, is that there's no information whatsoever about the large signal input impedance of the DUT. So you know what your source power is, you're gonna match with your source tuner, but you don't know what the input gamma of your, D, of your DUT is. Um, so you don't know the delivered input power to the device. Um, you can do this type of load pool with many different signals. You can use CW, pulse CW signals, two-tone or modulated parameters. Um, and depending on which type of instrument you use, power meter or spectrum analyzer, you can measure input and output power, so available, input available power and output power, um, transducer gain and efficiency. Uh, and if you use spectrum analyzer, you can get ACPR measurements or EVM measurements. <coughs> now probably the most accurate way for doing load pool measurements today is instead to do vector receiver load pool measurements. So the main difference is that here, um, you're not using power meters anymore, but you're using vector network analyzers to measure A and B waves. Um, now, between your device under test and your tuners, you'll have couplers. And that's why we call it vector receiver, because you basically sample the A and B waves coming in and out of the DUT, and you measure them with the vector network analyzer, and you, use, you rely on two-port calibration, uh, a full two-port calibration to de-embed your measurements uh, done by the VNA. And actually your powers now are basically calculated from the A and B waves according to the you know, standard equation. So the nice thing about this is that now you don't rely on any pre-calibration of the tuner. You only rely on the vector network analyzer calibration, which is quite accurate. Um, another important aspect is that you can get your input gamma measurements. So now you have access to all the four waves coming in and out of the, de of the device under test. So you can not only measure the source power, you can also measure the input delivered power to the DUT. And that's very important for model verification. Right, Tony? Yeah. Okay, thanks. So to summarize, um, vector receiver load pool is basically done real time. So it's, the quantities are measured real time on the device under test. There's no pre-characterization of the tuner required. It's VNA based. Um, this is probably the most accurate measurement uh, because again, it does not re rely on pre-calibration uh, and it does not rely on the repeatability of the tuner. Uh, and the large signal input impedance is measured in real time. Now, um, probably the only drawback, at least on, on classical, in the classical sense of this type of system is that you can do modulated measurements uh, because the VNA normally tends to measure CW and pulse CW signals. You can do two-tone. That's with conventional um, let's say systems. And now this is, uh, let's say, some examples of vector receiver load pool. Uh, 
so you can have several different topologies. Um, we have the IVCAT software to drive, let's say, all these different platforms and different vector network analyzers. So depending on your application, you can obviously cover you know, from very low frequencies all the way up to 67 gigahertz nowadays. So the, the drawback that I mentioned about the, the modulation part, we can solve it nowadays with uh, uh, something called the mixed signal active load pool system, which is again a subset, an example of vector receiver load pool. Um, but in this setup, basically what we do is we develop our own broadband VNA, um, and we have our own large signal vector signal generators so that we can do you know, load pool for wideband modulated signals up to a bandwidth of one gigahertz. But the basic, let's say, measurement capabilities is the same. It's still you know, doing A and B uh, measurement with vector receiver load pool. So just to summarize it, and then I'll, I'll hand the floor back. Um, this is a comparison between, call it traditional load pool and vector receiver load pool. Um, so I think I mentioned all of these points. Um, the, I think related to the model verification part, um, so, so the only one thing is that to validate the accuracy of the, in, in those two systems, uh, there's a bit different techniques. So in a scalar load pool, some of you might be uh, used to what's called the delta GT verification. So you basically, um, in this kind of verification, you basically compare the um, actual measurement of the transducer gain uh, as done by the system uh, with respect to the calculated transducer gain. That's what we call delta GT. And this should be, uh, let's say, zero. Um, but as you go farther from the center of the Smith chart, you can see the accuracy decreasing. Uh, in a vector receiver load pool, what we normally do is we verify the delta GP on a through. So we measure a through, and we can uh, basically check, uh, th this should be zero, uh, the, the gain of a through. And so we can check the spread of the gain as the gamma gets higher. Um, so once again, this is a table summarizing the, let's say, the differences of the two different systems. Uh, I think what I'd actually like to, you know, you take away from this is that for the model validation part, it's, it's actually very important to have this measurement of the input gamma uh, and of the input power because that's very often used for the model validation. And that's only available with vector receiver load pool. Thank you. So uh, then we will just have a very few slides about how we can use load pool measurements for uh, the model validation. Or even more compact model refinement. So we have seen that uh, we have different load pool architecture. There's, there may be some different approach that can be used to uh, refine the model over uh, load pool measurements, but here it's one of the presentation which is uh, proposed. So we will see how to use this load pool measurement results uh, to uh, optimize the model. So the optimization process we are proposing here is decomposed in three different steps. First, uh, as Moro said, we will uh, use the gamma in measurement information over uh, different power level of their different frequency to uh, fit the CGS and CGG uh, parameters of the model. Then, in the second step, we will see how to optimize the Tajima current source parameters. And finally, we will see how to optimize the gain, uh, output power, and PIE performances uh, using uh, CGD and CDS parameters as well. So here you can see that we have different set of measurements. Uh, the blue are the measurements, the red are the model. Uh, the dashed point uh, is for uh, the optimal PIE uh, uh, parameters. So let's, op let's observe, for example, um, uh, the dashed lines, uh, the measured and the model. So we can see that if we are only using pulsed IV and pulse S parameter measurements, which are linear measurements, uh, so we can have a quite huge difference. So this is why it's very important to fit as well the model against uh, load pool measurement 
without uh, destroying uh, the good fit we have been able to obtain over pulsed IV and pulse S parameter measurement. So the, first, the very first step is to optimize the CGS and CGD parameters to uh, align the input reflection coefficient uh, with the measurement. So we can see that on the top side we have the initial model response over uh, large signal harmonic balance simulation. And here, finally, we can see that we have a rather good fit uh, looking at the input reflection coefficient of the transistor when we optimize the different parameters of CGS and CGD. So you can see on, on the right side that we have uh, different parameters so we can uh, play with the threshold of the CGS and CGD value, but we can also play on the uh, VGS a value that will trigger uh, the different slope of the behavior of this different nonlinear capacitance model. So, as a first step, we will use these different parameters to align uh, the input reflection, the input impedance of the transistor. Once we have done that, we also need to pay attention to the uh, load pool simulation and load pool measurement comparison, lo especially looking at uh, the very first. Uh, point of the IV characteristic. If we are uh, observing the current consumption over the output power, we can see that sometimes we can have a small shift between the model response and the uh, load pool measurements. So the very first step will be to uh, refine the current source description in order to align uh, the very first point of the current source over uh, PO curve. And so this way, we need to play on different parameters, the current source, so it could be the pinch-off um, parameter, but also the IDSS parameters of the current source to, to align these measurements. Then, finally, we need to have a good fit between uh, the different large power char characteristics, such as the gain curve, the output power, and the PIE as well. So again, we will optimize the CGD and CDS parameters. You have to really uh, provide the compromise between the IV fit, the S parameter fit, and the load put fit. And if you have a good model, that is to say you have a model which is able to fit simultaneously the IV characteristic, S parameter measurement, and load pool behavior. And what we are doing at AMCAD is always to pay attention to the good fit on optimal PIE performances and optimal output power performances a large signal characteristic. And this is here the example we have in micro office, uh, the result, the typical result we are able to achieve. And obviously for some uh, given applications such as space application, we also need to make sure that the behavior of the uh, transistor is realistic when we tune the harmonic load impedance because we can, in load pool measurements, we can tune the harmonics to optimize the efficiency and we should be able to uh, reproduce the same phenomena uh, using the simulations. So this part was done to conclude uh, the compact model uh, development that we are using uh, with the different tool we are providing today. And then the next presentation will be provided by uh, this gentleman from IWR. And uh, we will see how they have used such a model in order to design uh, a PA.